Yeah, see, this, the, the most interesting thing is happening over there, right? <laughs> like the magic, the capture. Oh, great. Okay, so uh, this is a talk on demystifying uh, 8215.4, which is the file layer for Zigbee. And Zigbee, you know, maybe in your home, maybe in your hospital, uh, maybe around your person if you're into six low pan. Uh, and it's kind of creeping up on us uh, because smart meters and things like that. So. It's kind of important, I thought, uh, to, mis to demystify uh, that particular file layer. And we started an effort at Dartmouth uh, doing just that. And a lot of neighbors helped. Uh, Travis Goodspeed, whose name is on the slide, but unfortunately he could not be here. Uh, he'll be here later in the week. Uh, you can ask uh, him uh, questions and uh, you know hang out. Uh, Ray Jenkins, who is my student, who did all the work. I'm Sergey Bratus. Uh, I'm what they call a research associate professor at Dartmouth. Uh, and uh, here with us are Ryan Spears and David Dowd, Wave, uh, who designed the um, hardware peripheral uh, that can send raw USB frames, uh, raw, uh, USB. Uh, 802.15.4. This is not a phased answer talk, right? <laughs> uh, if you want a phased answer, I might have one on my person later. Um, and so what we're going to do is demystify 802.15.4. And then learn to fingerprint it, and uh, there might be an attack component as well. So you should know thy phi. People look at the, and this is, of course, the whore of Babylon. Um, we are in Babylon of various protocols, and those protocols are a mess. Uh, and uh, those protocols have nasty surprises for us. And uh, we always start this with the rights principle, which we made up and uh, named after Joshua Wright, after his quote uh, at the Turquan when he presented the Killer Bee framework, uh, which Ryan and David now maintain more than a half of. Um, the principle is security won't get better until tools for practical exploration of the attack surface are made available. That is to say, you can have all the theory and all the understanding, but until there is an easy way to poke at those things that you can uh, do in Python or your other favorite scripting language and just kick out of your USB port and have it transmitted over the air, security will not get better. And so this layered cake, uh, those two little layers of uh, 15.4, well, uh, let's see how much better we can make them by poking at them. Uh, we have a, a tool, uh, a suite of tools uh, for Scapy with which you can make 15.4 frames. And 15.4 frames are um, simpler than 82.11 frames. And that's the most you can say for them because they aren't really all that simple. And uh, it actually gets better because uh, the fields of that protocol are cross-dependent. And this is what you need a SCAPI uh, module for uh, when you build them so that uh, only those of, the, of uh, the relationships that you intend to violate and fuzz are uh, violated and fuzzed and the rest are uh, correct. And you have that with our .15d4. Now, the kind of hardware that we work with um, comes from a few different manufacturers. Uh, there is what they call the uh, T-Mode Sky, uh, Telos B. Uh, those were really, really uh, common uh, around universities uh, for a while when uh, sensor networks were being paid for. Uh, there are Atmel uh, RZ USB stick, a Frigduino Chibi uh, that, that includes uh, a 15.4 chip, uh, and a whole bunch of others. 
One platform that we're not using is software-defined radios because those are expensive and we kind of operate on a shoestring budget. So we started with um, uh, T-modes, but T-modes are hard to buy. And uh, unless you're, you have a line to a university that keeps throwing them out and you keep picking them up, and we re literally roam the holes harvesting uh, the abandoned um, uh, sticks uh, plugged in uh, in various corners left from various sensor network experiments. Well, you can now get the uh, AP mode uh, version 4 uh, from us. I have some to give out. And this is a ca capable uh, peripheral. It will do a raw frame injection for you. Uh, it, uh, the, the chip you see in the middle is the MSP430, Travis's favorite chip. Uh, this thing is actually based on the good fit, as you can see by the name uh, of the uh, uh, one bank of headers. And the other chip uh, there, uh, the one surrounded by an antenna, is uh, a Chipcon 2420. Uh, again, we're going to talk about it. We are going to give a talk about the architecture of this thing at the DEF CON Wireless Village. And maybe if uh, we have the time, uh, Ryan will go over this scheme. But this is just literally something that you can connect to your machine uh, through a USB and fire um, 8215.4 frames uh, that you make with Scapy uh, out of. So to code Travis, there is this profession, um, liar to children. Some people call it teacher, <laughs> right? So um, you hear that there are those things called frames, and sometimes they call them link layer frames. And you see uh, nice diagrams of those frames. You know, here's the frame control field, two bytes. Here's the data sequence number, and uh, here is the a bunch of uh, MAC addresses and the payload, and the uh, frame uh, check sequence at the end, but those things don't exist. They're a lie. They're a fairy tale, if you will. Now, fairy tales have their uses, but what you get over the air is just this waveform. And so there is this enormous gap in the way that people think about um, a stacked uh, uh, radio stack, and this gap is kind of like this. Right? So you somehow collect a waveform, and then you get the uh, uh, nice frame with byte values out of it. Right? So, and this is the magic of abstraction. And let's just see how magical that magic is. In fact, what you get is noise. I mean, most of the time, what you get is noise. And then magic happens, and suddenly this noise becomes the frame. And then magic has to happen again for the frame to end and to the, for, for, for noise to begin. And how does your hardware know? Well, it has little automata baked into its silicon that uh, do this magic. Those automata differ between chips. You can fingerprint different chips uh, from different vendors uh, by that uh, by those responses, by those automata, uh, by their differences. And this is where really interesting things start. So, for example, if you twist it just right, you can make chips of one maker hear the frame while none others do. Now, think of this as, say, an IDS uh, evasion technique or a technique for scanning for just this particular uh, building man energy management system while leaving uh, everyone else's uh, stuff alone. So, you know, there is this magic, magic, magic happening. Uh, and uh, the reason for this magic is that the thing is just a layer cake and everyone eats the top layer and kind of ignores the bottom ones. So the point of this talk is to have you, you know, uh, eat the uh, lower layers uh, and pwn them and just basically play with them. And uh, when we started, uh, I knew that something interesting was there, uh, but uh, really we didn't know all that much about it, and we discovered quite a few things, uh, and you know, this is what we're sharing. So 
Here is uh, the what you actually get uh, out of the air. Before that frame starts, there is other stuff in the air that your uh, chip uh, responds to. And this stuff is the preamble, the sink, uh, the start of frame delimiter. This is what makes the magic of recording the bytes start. This is what puts the uh, chip into the uh, I am in the frame mode. And then for the ending magic, uh, there is the length. So only so many bytes as follow the sync will be recorded. And you can mess with all of those three fields. So um, think of uh, your a typical uh, Zigbee peripheral as something that has a radio chip. That radio chip is connected to an antenna, gets uh, the um, uh, waveform, and what it spits out to a microcontroller, uh, something more capable uh, than uh, just a radio chip, is nibbles or bytes received over the air. In the case of uh, 8215.4, the symbols are nibbles half bytes. Uh, and this is a lie, right? Th th this too is a lie. We'll see just how much of a lie this is. And what connects those um, uh, chips is a serial bus. So you just bang out uh, the bits uh, that you received serially uh, with a clock. And that's how uh, those things talk. And this is how this thing is made. Uh, so you just send uh, the frame that you want to uh, send out uh, in a buffer. That buffer goes to the microcontroller. Over the spy bus, it goes to the uh, chip. Then you give the chip the command to transmit, and it transmits uh, that buffer uh, as, as waveforms. And so we're not going to look at layer two, which is the rest of that frame. We're going to look at the highlighted layer one, which is the preamble, the start of frame delimiter and the length. And this is the part that Wireshark just doesn't show you because the chips don't give it to you. They consider it for their own uh, consumption. But we will learn to send those parts of the frame under our control. So what we could do, for example, is vary the size of the preamble, vary the start of frame delimiter, and vary the length. Now, if I send you a longer length than the existing body, what will happen? The noise in the air will be picked up as the remaining bytes. So this is a very poor man sniffer, <laughs> right? Uh, we call this packet out of packet trick. So, and let's start from the beginning. Why preamble? Right? So uh, we make our signals out of sine waves, right? So we modulate the sine wave by amplitude or by frequency or by phase. But, you know, this is for sending data. But forget about data. How about we just learn to synchronize the clocks? And this is not trivial. Because in order to receive a sine wave, you have to know something about the period, about the frequency. Uh, you need clocks to do that. And the problem is that clocks drift, right? Clocks drift. Clocks drift uh, considerably uh, for those, um, uh, for, for the cheaper um, uh, peripherals that you normally use. So you need to synchronize the clocks. This is what the preamble is for. So you send uh, a repetitive signal a known repetitive signal, and an, an analog, analog part of the chip synchronizes itself uh, based on receiving that kind of a signal. And uh, this is not actually recorded digitally as far as we know. This is um, essentially the purpose of this uh, is to synchronize the clocks and get rid of the clock drift and adjust the clock. And of course, you can fingerprint uh, chips based on their clock drift. And we've done that uh, a few years ago at Schmuckon, if you're interested. And people have claimed that you can actually do that um, with um, uh, pretty good accuracy. 
on uh, Fujibly, and we showed that this was in fact not true. <laughs> but um, you know, that's that's a different story. And so the question is, how many of those bytes is actually enough? So four nibbles, four bytes, eight nibbles, can the clock synchronize itself uh, with a shorter sequence? Luckily, we can check that. A chipcon 2420 has a special register that contains the preamble length. So we can send different sized preambles and we can receive different sized preambles. And uh, clocks drift differently. In fact, it depends on the temperature. So the first look is, well, what if I send shorter preambles, right? And, uh, you know, I can send up to eight. Um, I can send shorter preambles. A preamble is eight nibbles. So what if I send no preamble at all, or just one nibble, or two, or three? And you know what? Different chips actually receive those things differently. So the red is the T-mode, and the T-mode uh, works uh, receives all of those shortened preamble packets uh, frames, uh, starting with uh, two nibbles. And, uh, and that's a chipcon chip. RZUSB stick, which is the Atmel chip, only hears things with six or seven nibbles. Uh, and uh, even that, not very well. And the Zigduino is somewhere in the middle. So I can take the, I can talk the dialect of a particular, of just the varying preamble and already distinguish between the chips. And the method here is uh, we uh, send a beacon request. And if they hear that beacon request, they respond. And we ch catch the response. So, uh, and this is... Uh, this is already enough to distinguish uh, between those chips on this axis. Okay, let's go on. Uh, why the start of frame delimiter? Well, so your preamble has synchronized your receiver, and now you can trust the bits that you're getting, the symbols that you're getting uh, out of your uh, digital receiver. Remember, it's all noise and there is always noise and you can't tell whether there is something being transmitted or there is noise or it's just a frame that's sent uh, by a very weak signal. So now we have to look into the frame and, you know, start believing the miracle that we're actually receiving data. And there is a shift register that matches for the standard sync A7. Okay. And uh, until the shift register matches and lifts that flag, we're out of frame. And once it matches, we're in frame. And the next thing is that we're going to record that many bytes and we're going to feed them as we go into our checksum routine. And then we'll know if the packet arrived um, uh, intact or was damaged, was stepped on by noise, because noise can step on any byte or any nibble. Okay. Is there something strange with this? The starter frame delimiter, the preamble, they're encoded exactly the same way as the body of the frame. Right? So the SFD is actually in the symbol set. This is not the case for Ethernet. This is not the case for PCI Express. This is not the case for uh, the packet radio. It is the case for 8215.4, and it is actually the case, kind of, for 8211BNG. Uh, the problem with BNG is that they switch the modulation in the middle of the frame uh, as a part of the transition from B to G, and of course, N is even more interesting. Uh, it might work for A, but uh, let's see what we can do with that. So here is this packet. What happens if that particular sink turns into a pumpkin? You know, there is always noise, right? What happens is you can actually send a packet that contains in its body, which is modulated 
and encoded exactly the same as the phi uh, preamble and uh, sync. The preamble, the sync, and the body of a frame in frame. And that frame will be received as the valid one. Because the start of frame delimiter will sync on the sync in the body of the frame. So we call this packet and packet. And uh, we described this in 2011. So, you know, here's a full frame, right? And if the sync goes bad, turns into a pumpkin, then that will be heard. Think about this. You can transmit phi, raw phi layer, uh, pre, uh, payloads, if you control the higher layer, the application layer of the frame, with, when six low pan uh, becomes an IP packets over Zigbee becomes a thing, you can actually email a beacon. Uh, aren't those things wonderful? I mean, hey, uh, people who design this aim for simplification of the protocol compared to 82.11, they simplified it too much. So you can send a five, five frame without the radio. The only thing you want is noise. There is always noise. There is absolutely always noise. And the noise is actually peaked. So it tends to kill one or two uh, nibbles, as it were. Well, um, yeah. So uh, this is the packet and packet paper. Uh, Orson Welles actually pulled that trick in his famous War of the Worlds broadcast. And, um, you know, go online and uh, listen to Travis's talk about that. Uh, that got um, a, a Pony Award. That trick got the Pony Award um, in 2011. This, all that I told you so far was actually a lie. That thing about uh, nibbles being sent over the air, well, they're not what is being sent over the air. What is being sent over the air is chips. A chip is an error correcting code. So when I say that the symbol is a nibble, it's not actually true. Uh, the nibble is this sequence of ones and zeros, which are error corrected. That is to say, if you receive one of those with a few bits flipped, you take the next closest by the uh, bit difference distance and you get your nibble. And this is, uh, in the silicon of the chip, and it too can be exploited. So uh, this is, you know, for example, the difference, uh, the distance between those two codes for one for the nibbles one and zero is uh, sixteen bits. Uh, the difference uh, between um, and that's that's enough basically. You need less than sixteen bits flipped to recover uh, by, by, the, uh, by the noise, uh, to recover the symbol. And this is pretty good, right? Uh, this happens before SFD matching. So in fact, you can use the error correcting logic to send those sequences out of alignment. You're seriously helped in this by the fact that um, those codes are actually rotated. They are uh, circular copies of themselves in two orbits, as we call them. And uh, uh, Travis was playing the cutout game with those. And if you look at the uh, International Journal of PRC or GTFO, the previous issue, you will find that cutout game and you can play it yourself. So, and these are bits. If you write them as a uh, hex, remember, this is the code that underlies the nibbles, you can see that they are uh, rotated. If you misalign those, which you can do with the packet and packet trick that we just discussed. Um, oh, this is great. Um, yeah, please allow me to... Uh, uh, yes, okay. <laughs> uh, so, if you misalign your uh, chips by one-eighth 
I thought I killed that thing. Uh, well, now I did. So you can actually send a stream of symbols that is that will be received nothing like it was sent. This is really interesting because if you're matching uh, the packet and packet tricks and you're trying to see that there is no packet uh, in the payload and you can try to insert uh, a few bytes before or after the SFD and then account for that and then exclude that from the payload as uh, some uh, researchers have done, uh, you are thwarted. Because if you send a sequence that is misaligned by one eighth of your nibble in chips, that will be read as the SFD. Because you see, those codes are really well aligned. So what that means is that the distance between them is much less than the 16 of uh, the error correction. So you will be receiving a frame that is nothing like it was sent. All you need to do is desynchronize that by uh, that much of, uh, of, of a nibble. So you sort of have this illusion of the file layer as taking a frame and transmitting a frame and you getting a frame and you expect to get a frame that was never, uh, that, that was a sent or you expect to not get it because it was damaged by noise. Nowhere in your threat model is the idea that you could be getting a completely different valid frame than the one that was transmitted. Yet the magic of Phi makes this possible. So you can actually receive frames that share no symbol with the sent frame. It's interesting. So, and again, those tricks you can do with, uh, if you control the stream of bytes uh, that goes out of your uh, radio, and you can do that. Okay, so then, of course, uh, for completeness, we should look at the modulation of chips. And modulation is, um, you know, conceptually is quite simple. Again, you have your uh, sine wave at a particular frequency, and you can do things to it, modify it, and the receiver on the other end uh, will pick up on that. So uh, you can have the amplitude modulation or the frequency modulation or the uh, um, or the um, phase shift modulation. So, um, or you can have just on-off keying. And on-off keying is just, well, you send the, uh, you have a telegraph key and you press it and hey, the there comes the uh, sine wave. And then uh, you let it go and then there is no sine wave. And then of course this is uh, the Morse code. What you can do is you can actually transmit Morse code if you can control a higher level protocol. So this is Morse code over an A2211 when you uh, uh, eh. and this is uh, this is uh, a call sign um, that you are that, that you can transmit um, uh, that way, and this is a really good signal because yeah, you know, Wi-Fi has its own modulation, but that doesn't matter. It really looks. It could really be made to look like an on-off key. So, file layers nest. You can emulate one file layer with another. That is interesting, isn't it? So you can actually man in the middle an SSL session that way uh, and hear it 
from rather far away, right? And uh, you just need to control the higher layer. So the phi is not the black box. Well, there is the frequency shift keying uh, when you send a slightly faster uh, oscillating uh, signal and uh, a slightly slower oscillating. And this is what Bluetooth uses. Uh, that's also interesting because you will hear a ghosting of that on a neighboring channel, if you think about this. And uh, it's uh, an inverted signal. With phase shift keying, uh, you uh, shift the phase of the sine wave. So think uh, of it as sending sine or cosine. And again, think of it as you having a sine wave going and a cosine wave going, which are just shifted in time, in phase. And then you switch between the two, depending on whether you want to send one or zero. And um, a variation on that is what is used for BPSK. We're working on uh, ways to cheat chips and to transmit signals that are both uh, uh, PSK and something else at once. But again, uh, once you understand how that works, it becomes easy. It becomes demystified. So a zero is a zero. Uh, and the one is a one, except when they aren't. So that thing about chips, right? That was a lie as well, right? They're just pieces of um, the um, sine wave. So, and now we come to the uh, real question. Do radios have dialects? Well, in fact, they do. We can send arbitrary symbol streams with uh, chip con 2420, and we can align them differently. And uh, the chip actually has a register that allows us to change the start of frame delimiter. So we can set it to something which is not the standard start of frame delimiter, and transmit anything we like as the inner packet of the frame. So uh, just think of it as an arbitrary injection. Uh, utility, just like you can uh, use a raw socket to inject into uh, your Ethernet. We corrupt the packets, we find out what corruptions work, and this has two uses. One use is that we can fingerprint those chips by what corruption, what corruptions that, what variations that respond to, and the other is that we can bypass uh, wireless intrusion detection systems. And this is separate from any manipulation of single strength uh, or range or anything like that. This is purely logical uh, what sort of bits you send for your preamble and SFD. And so uh, we had this argument with Travis. He's like fingerprinting, meh. You know, here's your Captain Obvious, right? A rock is a rock, great. Uh, and of course, radio uh, chips are all different. And then you start to think, well, who else looked at how uh, basic chemical elements are different, right? So there are nuclei, they differ in the number of neutrons that you have. Still the same element, a bit heavier um, kernel. So until, and who cares? Until it turns out that you actually do care. And you discover a thing that goes boom. And this is the chain reaction. And this is the nuke. So we called our um, uh, fingerprinting system isotope for that uh, reason. So let's talk about the actual fingerprinting and what we can do. Uh, this one we call the Cumberland Gap because Cumberland Gap uh, is how you get to Tennessee uh, from the east. And this is um, Travis's native culture. And I can actually... Uh, I will not try to sing the uh, song, uh, drink a little whiskey, take a little nap. We're 15 miles from the Cumberland Gap. Uh, my, he tells me that everything I uh, sing comes out as hop on the magic school bus. Um, so yeah, no vocals. So here's a normal frame. 
Uh, and it's got the eight nibbles of the preamble, which of course are chips, which of course are pieces of sine waves. Uh, and then uh, the start of frame delimiter. The interesting point is that the start of frame delimiter is matched after all of the chip and uh, sign magic. What if we send, and we already tried uh, reducing the preamble, but what if we send the, what if we send the preamble, then start of the frame, then a bad length, uh, or a bad uh, SFD, and then start a new uh, packet. So, Presumably, the chip would spend some time to recover from this badness, and you can fingerprint the um, uh, the uh, timing difference. Here's another one, which turned out to be simpler and worked better. Uh, in the preamble, some of those zeros you replace with Fs. We we'll call it Franconia Notch because this is how you get to New Hampshire. Uh, where we all, um, uh, we are, where we are all neighbors, uh, from, you know, uh, less hospital, hospitable parts of New England, such as Massachusetts. So, um, again, drink a little whiskey, take a little nap. There is another one that we call the Franconia Bridge. This one, uh, uses the full preamble but inserts garbage bytes of Fs between the start of frame delimiter and uh, the preamble. So now you think, how could this be? Well, the preamble mostly pertains to the analog part of the chip. The SFD uh, is matched digitally by the shift register. Those extra Fs, well, maybe they won't bring that uh, uh, chip out of uh, a sync, depending on how many we are. So they sort of bridge that space between the preamble and the SOD. And here's your typical New Hampshire covered bridge, because uh, getting snow off bridges in the winter kind of sucks. So here is the Franconia notch uh, in detail, right? So you start replacing the uh, preamble with your Fs. And you start sending those frames. And what do you see? The Atmel chip on the RC-USB will get them all. The Chipcon chip will not, except for a weird fluke, uh, that one in the second column. So you can actually have an Atmel chip, hear your frames, and respond to them, while the uh, uh, Chipcon chip is none the wiser, and thinks that there are no packets in the air, that there is only garbage. Isn't that interesting? So, in that range, you can remain uh, unheard, even though you're transmitting like crazy. Now think of those chips, uh, say, sitting in your uh, thermostats or your smart meters. Smart, right? Uh, there is this joke about, um, you know, if you call something a science, it usually isn't. That pertains to computer science to a certain extent. Um, well, so if you call something smart, it usually isn't. Uh, so, you know, some people say, you know, smart grid or, you know, smart homes. And what you hear is like really, really dumb systems that you can. Uh, five minutes. Yes. Okay. So, um, and we have similar r results uh, across other chips. And they are in our technical report, which is posted online. You're welcome to it. Uh, this is what you actually hear with a uh, packet analyzer uh, that comes with the RZ-USB uh, chip uh, that um, uh, gives you the preamble, right? So this is the uh, PCAP 
And you can see that only a few of those packets with the uh, full preambles make it, and others don't. So we call this, we decided to call this a dialect, right? You speak past some chips to the others. Of course, what you speak might be an actual uh, exploit or, you know, an actual fake frame or something like that. So another name for that dialect is shaped charge. Uh, and you're welcome, again, you're welcome to play uh, with, uh, with these things. Uh, well, phi is not mysterious. Phi is, in fact, and it's certainly not a black box. And the interesting thing is that all of the boundaries between the layers are imaginary. All of the boundaries between constructs of those layers, such as bits or nibbles, or symbols, or bytes, or fields of uh, a frame. They're all imaginary. They do not exist. They're a lie. They're a fairy tale told to engineers to allow them to sleep. And then, of course, what comes out of that is, uh, is pwnage. So the deeper a layer, the simpler are its machines, because they don't know the intent of what they receive. They just match a particular sequence of uh, uh, symbols or, or, or nibbles, uh, and then checksum them and do those things. So, in fact, you can send things that you receive things that were never sent as such. And uh, of course, the lesson of this is that layers of abstraction become boundaries of competence. And uh, fairy tales do have a use, but they are also quite dangerous uh, if you base your security on them. So fairy tale based security of uh, um, uh, layers of a network stack is a prevalent. And we are, in fact, in Babylon with respect to the design of protocols. And, um, you know, Tower of Babel, imagine the Tower of Babel somewhere in the picture. Um, and enjoy it, you know. <laughs> enjoy Babylon. <laughs>